the director of the Center for <laughs> Policy Studies. It's wonderful to see so many of you here. At the CPS, we've been, long been fascinated by the whole subject of broadband and how to improve the quality of all of our services, which there are of which are obviously plenty of complaints. The recent survey showed that 60% of Brits feel that they've been let down by their broadband in the last month, and only 2% of the UK now has access to super-fast broadband behind Lithuania and Kazakhstan. Um, for those of you who aren't members of the CPS, a plug to become one uh, will keep you at the forefront of all our policy work. Uh, we're very excited that uh, we have extensive contacts at the highest level of government and are working closely with the new <coughs> ministers and advisors. We're very grateful to David Bowen for helping us to arrange this event and it's also very timely uh, to be discussing this at the moment. Uh, just the other day, Matt Hancock, who will be with us at 2 o'clock, and he sends his apologies for running behind, but he will be joining us shortly. Uh, they did, the DCMS did say that they were still considering full structural separation remains an option. Uh, I'll now just introduce the panel quickly. Um, Paul Morris is Head of Government Affairs at Vodafone and is responsible for Vodafone within Whitehall and Westminster. I'll stand up. Um, I think with these things, I'm still um, slightly surprised we get a full room talking about broadband, but I think that's good, and it just shows you the importance of this of this sub subject. But thanks for thanks for coming on. I know there's lots of other things to, to listen to at the part of the conference this year. I, I think from a Vodafone perspective, I just wanted to sort of talk about why we think fibre is indeed good for all of us, um, and also just make the case briefly for us as a country um, to be a bit more ambitious in our uh, in our what we need in terms of our digital infrastructure, and um, just to make sure that we keep up with what is clearly demands for future internet use. And let's be honest, we are a leading digital nation in our usage of technology, and I think we just need to make sure that we have the infrastructure to back that up. Um, so, why are we interested as a Vodafone? Um, I don't know which one of you is going to ask me about mobile coverage in the room. I'll probably get somebody. And um, so, you know, we aren't just actually these days a mobile uh, cover a mobile network operator, and we still are a mobile network operator, and we're investing to bring 4G to virtually the whole country, um, and we're not, if we haven't got it yet, it should be coming your way very soon. But, but equally also, we bought cable and wireless about four years ago, so we're actually increasingly a fixed provider. A fixed provider means broadband, really, if you know. And, and so we've got a, a fibre network um, that we use to deliver broadband connectivity to businesses, and, and we just launched a broadband product for consumers. Now, like most broadband and mobile operators, we use OpenRidge um, um, to connect to that final bit um, of you, to your homes and your businesses, but also, crucially, to mobile masks, which do need to have a broadband connection. Not everyone realises, but increasingly, as you use your 4G and your mobile internet, you need to have a much uh, better connection to your mast, uh, you know, basically fibre connection, but quite a fat pipe in lots of places. More people, the more they use it, the fatter the pipe needs to be. So, um, Oakridge was created uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, Craig? 10, 11, nearly 11 years ago, um, by Ofcom in agreement with BT. And the focus then was really around how they could ensure that more providers could provide broad broadband uh, connectivity to consumers. It's largely built on what was the privatised copper telephone network, um, which we all remember in the, in, in, it was privatised in the 1980s, and in fact cable and wires was, came out of Mercury, if any of you are old enough to remember that, uh, which was the competitor, was supposed to be the competitor to BT. But of course 10 years is a long time in technology, isn't it? And uh, David's brought along something I need to show you later, which is the latest technology, but I'll give you one example, um, which is basically 10 years ago there was no such thing as a smartphone, and today there are 71% of us own one. So, you know, this is the things that have changed, and all of those are connected to the internet, and that is the mobile internet. So it's really important that we make sure that the networks can keep up with that demand. So today the challenge is different. Um, the challenge really is how we ensure that strategic decisions of BT, which owns the OpenReach network and runs it, makes sense for the country and not just the company. 
So basically, we need, we, need, we need a broadband network that can support our digital demands. And the question is, do we have that today? And probably, maybe more importantly, will we have it into the future? Now, this is largely a debate around technology and around network technology specifically. And I, I know that we have some experts in the room, so I'll try not to butcher this too much. But basically, what, what, we, what we have today <coughs> is a mix of copper, which is the old telephone network, with fibre, um, which has been rolled out um, largely to the green, the green cabinet, not exclusively. Um, so you've basically got fibre going from the green cabinet to homes and to businesses, but again, there's a mix of things because sometimes the fibre goes to, uh, from the exchange. And the question is, is that going to be good enough? Um, uh, and, and the problem with copper you have, and as we all experience, is, is that the experience is variable. It's variable possibly in the street where you live, certainly in your, in your community. <coughs> Um, so the quality of connections can depend on how close you are indeed to that green cabinet. Um, and, 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 you know, and then there are other obvious problems as well. I mean, we found in Spain, for example, that where we do have a fiber network, and we've rolled that out to hundreds of businesses, uh, that we have 50% fewer faults on that network than the copper network equivalent run by the BT equivalent in, in, in Portugal. So it's also more reliable. It's newer, basically. I mean, you would expect that. So the danger actually here is that we are going to fall behind our competitors across the world, countries across the world, in particular in Europe. So if I look at the averages in Europe for fibre to the premise, which is the new technology, um, the average of coverage in Western Europe is now 25%. That's 25% coverage of this newer technology, fibre to homes and businesses, direct to homes and businesses. In uh, Sweden and Spain, they have 80% coverage. In Portugal, 60%. Norway and Denmark 50%, and Portugal and Spain have, have said that they will cover up to 95% by 2020. In the UK today, we have 2%. So, I'm, and you know, BT has committed, admittedly, to do more, and they've committed, I think, to cover 2 million more homes by 2020, and that would take us to around, I think, 10%, but that would take us from where we are today, which is last in the rankings, to, um, to fourth last. And the key thing here is actually we're not 2% super fast, so, but it's actually, this is about the newer technologies, which is going to be the fibre to probably which will be 100 plus. Um, so this is the newer technologies. So basically, I don't think personally that's good enough, and our company doesn't think that's good enough, and we don't think it's ambitious enough. And clearly in the current environment, we need to be world leading with our infrastructure, including digital infrastructure, and not lagging. So basically what we've said as a company um, is that we think we need to be ambitious and we need to basically commit as a country to deliver a gigabit Britain by 2030 and that needs to be driven by what we're now calling pure fibre but that's basically fibre that connects to your home and to your business and we need government to support this in policy terms at least and that will mean upgrading the network that we have today and we need to find ways to do that and, and obviously the first cab of the rank here is the Ofcom review which, which Tim mentioned and Ofcom have got a strategic room review the first one for 10 years and we basically, I mean, we've been pleased, Ofcom have recognised that fibre is the future, and it, but basically what we're to ensure is that Openreach is in a position to help to deliver the gigabit um, Britain and not, not basically get in the way and crucially serve all of us as the customers of Openreach because we, we pay to use that network as the Sky and 500 other companies. Crucially keep, uh, treat us all, all equally. And we do need Openreach to commit to a gigabit Britain and we need to, uh, to work as an industry to deliver it. Now, I think our first step for that, in our mind, is that Ofcom, at minimum, needs to ensure that uh, Openreach has full set legal separation as part of its review. That means it needs its own board, it needs to control its own finances and investment. And if this isn't possible, and if it's not delivering on, on, our, on this ambition for a gigabit Britain, well, then they've got to find another way, and that then brings in uh, structurally separating um, Openreach from BT if we're not delivering. So that's where we are, that's what we think, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Your questions. Thanks. Uh, David Bilden is uh, manager's group for public policy, government relations, and industry engagement for Sky. Thank you very much. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, so Paul's stolen most of my thunder, which is often the way when you go second in these events. So uh, I will seek to try to do something slightly different and talk about uh, some of the issues that we're confronting um, as a business and we look forward to the future of our connectivity um, in this country. I mean, the, first, the first question that we have to answer is the question on the, on the exam sheet, which is, is fibre good for you? 
And, and it seems to us that there is absolutely no question that uh, fibre connections to every premise in the country is absolutely good for us as individuals, but more importantly, good for the country. The fact of the matter is that technology advancements, the way that our economy is developing, our ability to be competitive, fundamentally depend upon connectivity. And what that does for us as an economy and a society is create a much more frictionless economy, allows us to trade with each other more swiftly, to utilize the technologies that we're building, uh, and actually to reduce the transaction costs in the economy. And ultimately, that's how we prosper, and that is how we address productivity issues. So fiber, it seems to us, is obviously good for you. Why fiber? Well, it's a technology that really can't be easily beaten, essentially. It relies on the speed of light. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody coming up with something that's faster. But critically, it's also highly reliable. And uh, if you think about a world where we may well be, in 10 years' time, less than a decade, be getting used to driverless cars, the one thing you don't want is your connection falling over. Uh, that would not be a pretty sight. But there are technologies that are just on our doorstep now that need faster speeds and need more um, uh, capacity. Uh, I'm holding here a virtual reality headset. So yesterday, Sky launched uh, the first virtual reality app of a, of a British broadcaster. Uh, where you can download content onto your smartphone, put it in a headset like, like this, and really literally look around you at a, 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 a film that we've shot, put you immersed into all sorts of environments, whether it's a sporting event or a, a news event. We've shot some fantastic footage of what's going on in the Cali camps. So if you get a chance, actually, after this, um, some of the Sky stuff have got these, and do, do test them out. But that's an example of the kind of technologies that are here today that are relying on better speeds, more reliable infrastructure, and ultimately our economy is going to depend upon. So if it's so obvious, the question you must be asking is, why is it so difficult? Why, why aren't we doing it? More importantly, if it's so obvious, if there is an obvious need, why is the owner of the national infrastructure not already doing it? And that is a very good question, and it's a question that a lot of us have been asking over the last uh, 12 months of this debate, which is, why is it that BT uh, is not building fibre? And I think it goes to the heart of the review that Ofcom has undertaken and is now reaching um, a conclusion. And look, you can be absolutely forgiven for thinking that we as an industry, Paul and myself and others, are just banging on about an arcane argument over industry structure. And I kind of get that. I certainly get why politicians are a little bit fed up hearing industry, frankly, knocking um, five bells out of each other. You kind of want us to sort it out. Uh, and you know what? We want us to sort it out. We want our industry to start mobilizing the capital that is going to make a difference here. And I think that is the key. That is the absolute key if we are going to build fibre, is finding a way to mobilise capital, private capital, in the main, more effectively and more efficiently. And there's a couple of reasons, I think, why you're not seeing that happen now. Uh, the first is, it's just not in the interests of the national uh, infrastructure owner to upgrade the network in the way that we'd like them to, to do. It is in their interest, quite frankly, to, to sweat the asset. And that's what we're seeing. What we're seeing, essentially, is a series of investments that kind of incrementally push fibre deeper into the network. But all of our properties, bar 2%, that's all we've got connected to fibre now, 2% of properties in this country, one of the lowest in the developed world. Uh, only 2% are connected to fibre. We're all relying on this copper technology. Uh, and frankly, it has all sorts of problems in terms of reliability, but also variable speeds, it degrades, it requires a lot to maintain, it's an expensive network. But economically, it kind of makes sense to continue to sweat that, to continue just to push at the margins and not to make that big leap that we need to make. And, and the second reason why it's quite difficult to see how in the current industry structure you're going to break through that is that it's really impossible to optimise <coughs> the demand that exists at the moment to leverage private, private capital. The, the simple fact is that companies like Sky and indeed Vodafone, who rely on BT, are paying BT 
a large amount of money to rent, rent that network uh, every year. And in Sky's case, it's running, uh, running uh, to, towards £800 million pounds a year. Now, when we look at the way that we fund infrastructure in other areas we're involved in, like putting satellites in the air, we find it very easy to enter into long-term deals with the infrastructure owner uh, to say, we will rent this capacity from you for 10 years. And if we fill it, then, the, then we're, we're the ones benefit. But if not, then all the risk is on us. Okay? We enter into those guarantees. That enables them to go and raise the money that allows them to blast a rocket into the air and put a satellite into the air. We can't do that now with our telecoms infrastructure. We cannot, because OpenReach is owned by our biggest retail competitor, in all honesty, enter into a 10-year contract to give our biggest competitor nearly a billion pounds a year. And that's a fundamental problem, and it's limiting the ability to mobilise capital. And that's why the market structure really matters. If you had an independent open reach, you'd be able to aggregate all of the money that we all spend with them every year. You'd be able to enter into long-term, we call them, uh, take-or-pay contracts that would guarantee and take the risk on the retail operators that would allow the infrastructure owner to go and borrow the money from the markets to invest in the infrastructure. And that is why market structure really, really matters. And if we had that, if we had a separate infrastructure owner that wasn't conflicted by the country's biggest retail operator of telecoms, uh, I think we would see very quickly a sea change. Uh, I don't believe that the argument that this would create massive uncertainty and would delay investments that are already underway has any validity whatsoever. First of all, those investments that are trumpeted from the skies are actually just the run rate. They're just the existing run rate that's, that, that is being deployed at the moment to keep the network ticking over and to upgrade it incrementally. They're not massive investments when you look at them uh, oh, compared with, with what's gone on historically. Uh, and so uh, the, the, there isn't sort of a disruption to something that is already planned. There is no current plan. Uh, and secondly, all companies know how to deal with corporate separations and acquisitions when they want to. They find it really easy, including, by the way, BT, that sold off O2 over a decade ago and found no problem with that whatsoever. When a company is motivated, believe me, I'm speaking from a company now, we know how to do it. When we're not motivated, we find ways not to do it. It's funny, that, but that's the way it works. And, of course, there may also be a role for government. Uh, we're not saying that this is going to solve all the connectivity problems. There will be edge cases, there will be parts of the country where we may well need some um, government capital. But actually, the key role for government capital is essentially to help to stimulate the private sector to do their job. And it's critical that we don't fall into the trap of the government saying, we're going to throw a whole lot of money at this industry in the way that it is at the moment uh, without making some fundamental change. Because ultimately, I fear we're going to be spending money where we don't need to. It's our taxpayers' money where we don't need to. We need to work out how far the industry can take this and then work with the government to do the remainder. So I hope that's explained to you why this argument really matters. I hope that's explained to you why fibre is good for you. And uh, I look forward to the debate to come. Thank you. Lewis is the Senior Advisor on Infrastructure Policy at the Institute of Directors. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, and delighted to be here with you today. Um, I sometimes think that government really is about giving people what they need, and business is about giving people what they want. Uh, and really successful business is about giving people what they didn't even know they wanted, uh, to which you might add uh, iPhones, iPads, and I would say quite possibly gigabit connectivity. But we know what our members want, we have surveyed them, uh, and they all want fast internet, no surprise there. I've never met anyone who wants slower internet. But they also told us that it was the most important infrastructure issue for them. And so when we did, find, when we did survey our members, we got some quite amazing results. 12% said that with faster internet they would hire more, 34% said they would invest more, 38% said it would lead to an increase in revenues, 50% more flexible working, 60% said it would increase competitiveness, and 77% were 
would produce, say, would produce more productivity. Um, this is a nationwide survey. You'll find no other infrastructure project out there that would generate such good results. But I do sense that there's really a huge disconnect uh, between the consumption and data growth, uh, which is running, depending on what sort of metric you use, at least 40% a year, 6% a month, uh, and the actual level of, of investment. Um, and particularly, we've talked a bit about the incremental upgrades, but if I could just detail a bit more about that. So, we've just had nationwide quite a big upgrade to super fast broadband, which is not very fast, incidentally. Um, but it will, it, it's paced at two levels, so just under 40 megabits per second uh, and just under 80. The next stage from there could be uh, what they call vectoring, which will take it up to 100. After that, it would be G dot <coughs> fast, uh, and after that, XG dot fast. So that actually lays out the next 10 years of copper upgrades. And I do think we need to ask the question, if this does go ahead, um, will that have a crowdy out effect on fiber investment across the country? Because I think the consequences are quite clear. So if you look at the World Internet Society, we have a world ranking of 26 uh, in download speed, but more critically, uh, 39th in upload speed. And I think the internet is, is really becoming much more about uploading data, uh, especially with cloud-based services. And one of the findings uh, from our survey was that just 30% are using the cloud for data storage, their data storage. And I think that is actually uh, a very clear indication of, of how we just don't have the upload speed to, to manage it. So what do we do about it? Um, we at the Institute Directors are very big fans of competition, always have been. Um, but we need competition, but before we get to that, we need to increase the incentive to invest. And one example that I thought was very exciting, uh, and Tim mentioned Lithuania, but I don't know how many of you know that it has the global uh, number one ranking for ICT infrastructure. It has the second or third fastest internet in Europe, uh, and is habitually in the top five in the world. And this is a country which has a GDP per head roughly a third of our own. And the really interesting thing is about how they did that, because if you go back 12, uh, 12 or more years, they're in roughly the same position as ours. They had a national incumbent that owned the network, and they decided in 2004, they mandated open access, uh, and then they set the access charges extremely low. This led to an explosion in infrastructure competition, uh, an investment by the Ortnet. In fact, 61% of the additional uh, network infrastructure was built by the Ortnet, and it even incentivized the incumbent uh, to make additional investments themselves. They now also have 120 ISPs uh, competing, uh, which itself is pretty amazing considering they only have 1.2 million households. So I do think that's uh, a very positive example of us to look at. Uh, I think the example of New Zealand's being well covered. Uh, our position is uh, we're open to the idea. We don't, uh, we're not at the stage yet, and we may not be, where we think that should, should happen in terms of uh, full separation. Um, I suspect there's much more to be done in terms of increasing aggregate investment by lowering access uh, charges to, to the uh, network. So, the incentive to invest is so important because it is going to cost money. So by one estimate, it will cost uh, 20 billion. But two thirds of that, and we're talking about five to the premise for 29 and a half million premises. Um, I'm always reminded that uh, it's not five to the premise, it's premises. Um, because uh, a premise is the basis for an argument. Um, but um, the first 20 million homes uh, could be connected, uh, I'm told, at about 500 pounds each. That's roughly the same cost that it would be for GDOT Forest. And so what we're talking about here is do we want to spend once or do we want to spend several times? And that's, I think, really what this comes down to. So I think we have everything to gain. Um, we've heard a bit about virtual reality, uh, which I think is incredibly exciting. But it, it's really about, uh, we have a great opportunity here to create a dynamic rural economy as well. Uh, no one is going to launch a startup uh, in a barn in the back, at the back of a farm if they have a 0.5 megabit uh, dial-up speed connection. But if they have one gig, a whole new world opens up. Uh, and then you actually start to think, you know, you may even have some reverse urban scaling. Um, 
as I was trying to persuade Tony Travers last night, I don't think he's completely convinced. Um, so, more than anything, if, uh, and I thought we might as well bring Brexit into this as well, if some of you are worried about losing access to 400, the market of 450 million people, um, I would urge you to consider that 4 billion people are going to be joining the internet in the next few years. And that is the mother of all markets that I think we need the connectivity to reach. Thank you. While we wait for Matt Hancock to arrive, we'll take some questions. Um, okay. uh, Fibre plus 5G mobile for uh, the last mile, uh, would that be a good way to leapfrog uh, BT Open Reach? Well, I mean, I think the reality is we've got to look at the complementary technologies on which I think we arrive, but then let's be really clear, in 5G we will need more fiber. I mean, we'll just need more fiber, we we'll need more time. So, you know, ultimately I think, you know, if we don't solve this problem um, in the next few years, or well, we don't have an ambition to build out at the same time, then I don't think we can optimize uh, 5G. Because already today, uh, in some parts of the country where the, where the network isn't great, I think broadband network isn't great, one well, network's not great, that can hold up the um, 4G network. So, so I think, frankly, it's very important that we do both. Uh, Dave. Hi. Um, sorry, I just want to stand up. Um, oh, please, thank you. Thanks, I'm David from BT. Um, <laughs> um, thanks for letting me in, Tim. Whether you'll let me out again is another question. Um, just wanted to come back on the super fast figure. You said um, only 2% in the UK. It's actually 90%. Uh, that's Ofcom's uh, measure. You, I think, got mixed up with FTTP. Um, and um, the comparison with uh, Lithuania and uh, Kazakhstan, which, although charming, is um, a little uh, wide of the mark. In um, Lithuania, many people live in uh, flats, for instance. It's very easy to supply um, ho um, homes in. Um, and, and it's the same in Spain as well, supply um, multiple dwelling units with FTTP compared with the sort of layout that we have in the UK. Um, one of the other interesting things is Australia um, went for FTTP and um, then gave up um, because it was just too hard to do. And quite a lot of people were covered by FTTP, but actually 75% of those who were went for the lower package, 25 meg, they didn't want any more than that, so um, that's something to consider as well. Um, in terms of falling behind, I would argue that we haven't, um, we're ahead of the major economies in Europe on super fast broadband, and that's uh, a mixture of fibre and copper. Copper is great stuff, you can put uh, G-fast on it and get ultra-fast speeds in the future. It's also very, very fast to roll out. If we started rolling out FTP, FTTP now, um, we'd be having a very different conversation today because uh, actually quite a lot of the country wouldn't be covered. Um, uh, David's point, is fibre good for you? Yes, we absolutely agree. Something like uh, the average BT line is about 90% fibre, 10% copper and it's worth us uh, investing and maintaining that copper network because, of course, the fibre network wouldn't work without it. Um, driverless cars, interesting too, but we wouldn't connect them to fibre. Um, why is BT uh, not building fibre? Um, we put fibre in the ground and um, Sky and Talk Talk didn't use it for two years because they wanted to use the copper connections. That they had. Interesting now that it's uh, at the time of the DCR, this is uh, a bigger point as it is. Um, and as for the industry uh, knocking five bells out of each other, um, sorry, am I going on? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll just go on for a little bit longer. Um, yeah, we, we um, in terms of, um, yeah, sorry, I covered that. Um, why, um, why did Sky and Talk Talk not invest in, uh, in FTTP before us? That's well, at the same time as us, even. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's about it. 
Any questions? Uh, a few shams. If I let um, well, when you ask, you ask yeah, that's a small question, and then we can respond yeah, sure, to sure, more sure. substance to that. Um, the, the lady in the middle there. Sorry. Sorry. Hi there, my name's Emma Crane. I, I'm a, I'm a councillor in a rural ward. I'd just like to respond to, to what's just been said by BT. I would say we would absolutely love to have fibre rolled out to us. We've been waiting for years yeah. to have BT Open Reach connect us up. The problem that we have is even if the cabinets are enabled, all the villages in my ward are too far away from the cabinets. So the only solution, as I can see, is, is to have fibre. We would absolutely love it. People are trying to run businesses. I get contacted all the time. They can't download, upload, access banking, anything. I just don't think it's good enough in, in this day and age. We need to do more for people. And, and it's in the Midlands as well. So it's supposed to be the heart of the economy. And at the moment, it's, it's failing to do that. So I'd just like a response on that from you. Okay. As I say, we have uh, covered 90% of the UK now with uh, super fast broadband. Excuse me, but that's population the population geographic. That's premises, sorry. sorry but, but it's premises. the hard to connect. Yes, no, no, we, uh, we up, believe me, we, we fully understand um, that issue. I, I'm actually one of those people, and um, but we are getting to you. In the words of uh, Vodafone, uh, we will get there as soon as we can. But the feeling is if it were opened up to other competitors, we'd get there more quickly and people could have a choice. And well, well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, is uh, Sky probably to... Uh, yeah, exactly. Is Sky... Are you in a waffle. server rural area? Waffle. waffle. Come on. Do you, do you, I don't know you, you finished, is that... Do you want no, to, I'll ask you to, to respond? Yeah. So, look, I, I think... Uh, I... I, I I with you. I, I, I live in a rural area and um, I, I've got two maybe. Um, Me too. So uh, it's, it's frustrating and it, it should have happened more quickly that the infrastructure was upgraded. Um, and I, and I, think, I think we all acknowledge that there are some, some, <coughs> some two very fundamental problems here, which is uh, a adequate speed in those areas that are harder to reach that still are lagging behind, uh, which are being slowly delivered to, but I mean, goodness knows it's taken an awful long time, and even afterwards are still reliant on quite old-fashioned technology. So the reliability issues, I'm afraid, although you may get a bit faster, they're not going to go away. And I was slightly, slightly depressed by David's um, sort of approach to the argument that we're making is that this is a, as a country we have to be more ambitious. This isn't about today, it's about 10 years time. It's about our competitiveness versus all of those other countries that are significantly upgrading their infrastructure and are taking the, the, the big and difficult decisions to do it. Look at New Zealand. New Zealand is going to have fibre all the way to 80% of its premises by 2022. This is New Zealand with 6 million people and a land mass about the size of the UK, with a lot of mountains. Uh, now, that 20% that's left, clearly there's going to have to be some intervention to, to, to be able to address that. But at least there's an ambition there to set their economy onto a new trajectory. And all we're hearing <coughs> is, you know what? We don't need to do this. There's no economic justification for doing it. And we're not going to do it. And uh, one of the statements that David made was just, I found it absolutely staggering. He said the fiber network wouldn't work without copper. Well, duh. That's precisely the cause. <laughs> they are simply incrementally pushing fiber out, dependent upon that last bit of copper, and that's the bit that is slow and creaky and breaks down and doesn't work. We are advocating a step change here. So we're not dependent on fiber on copper anymore. And that's the way we start to transform the opportunities and the prospects and the productivity of our, of our country. Um, and I, look, I will respond to David's challenge, what, why aren't we doing it? Actually, uh, we and um, Talk talk Together um, and why didn't you have, 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 have run out um, uh, um, an experiment in, in York where we've uh, rolled out fibre to the premise, the premises. Uh, we'll to use the S there. Um, uh, and, and actually, you know, we've, we've, been, we've been 
quite pleased with the results. We've actually certain our learnings are that rolling out fibre to the premise, premises um, is very much doable. But the economics of it are incredibly challenging if you're not the owner of the national network. Because you have no legacy infrastructure which you can deploy. But more importantly, when we look to compete in the retail market for those households in York that we want to sign up, about half of it refuses to use the network we've built. It's the half that uses OpenReach, right? So the economics of it, of building two networks, when you can't compete for all of the demand, are really challenging. And I can't see how any industry structure that doesn't address that is going to fundamentally change the equation with regards to investment in next generation network. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to summarise very briefly for Matt, who is uh, great to see here. Uh, then perhaps Matt would like to say some more words, and then perhaps we can uh, take up the conversation again. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Matt, you won't be surprised to know that the, that the uh, industry is represented by Vodafone and Sky, and indeed the Institute of Directors are calling for a much more ambitious vision of uh, broadband in the future, that it's creaky at present, but if you're looking 10 years ahead, we should be looking at a one gigabit uh, infrastructure. Uh, therefore, they need the infrastructure to be developed now to get to that stage, but the obstacles in, uh, uh, in the form of open reach and its relationship with BT make it possible to mobilize the private investment that is needed for the new infrastructure that, in their eyes, BT prefers to sweat the copper assets, uh, which makes it impossible for them to leverage private capital into uh, development. Uh, the IOD has some very impressive data on, uh, from their members on uh, how they would respond to far better broadband provision, including 12% would say they would hire more people. 77% of their respondents said that it would lead to greater productivity, which they would say would be more great themes. Um, BT have been vocal, obviously, in defending themselves, uh, uh, pointing out that uh, Copper is very fast to roll out, but in Australia, only 25% of the population took up FTTP when it was available. Um, and uh, uh, believing that the, their retail customers uh, had not been quick to use it when it was available. But over to you. Uh, thanks very much, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to see that it's packed. I really <laughs> care about broadband. I really care about um, rolling it out and getting it faster. Um, there's a number of reasons I really care. The first is that I spend 15 minutes of every day of my life signing letters to people uh, who are very unhappy with their broadband coverage. Uh, we then email them these letters. Um, the, um, <laughs> sometimes I email somebody a letter responding to an email about their poor broadband and scratch my head whilst I'm doing that. The, um, so I care because um, it, uh, there's, a, there's a problem. Uh, I care because it's vital for the future of the economy and for everybody's participation in it. You might have noticed that at this conference we're talking about a country that works for everyone. Um, we put it on a few uh, billboards, and it is, but it is our driving motivation as well in government, and of course that means connectivity. Um, I would have uh, changed the title of this event, if I'm allowed to, because I'd say it's building connectivity that's fit for purpose, yeah. um, because what matters to me is that when I turn my uh, phone on or open up my laptop, I can connect to the, uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, I don't care whether that signal comes down uh, over the airwaves or down a bit of uh, copper or down a bit of fiber. Uh, what I care is the, um, the, the, what I, the connectivity I get, the speed, the download speed, the, up, the, the upload speed, the latency. Uh, and I also care for this reason. As the Minister for Digital and Culture, I meet loads of really interesting people. And from time to time, but far too often, I meet somebody really interesting and I want to talk to them about a really interesting thing that they've done. And instead, they badger me about their broadband connection. Um, this happens much too frequent, frequently, and so I wanted to stop. Uh, so what are, we going to, what are we going to do about that? The first thing 
is to broaden uh, the reach of uh, high-speed broadband and to make sure that everybody has access to it. The universal service obligation in the digital economy bill that's in front of Parliament at the moment that I'll take through Parliament, I think it's incredibly important to make sure everybody has got the basic uh, connectivity that they need. Um, the the um, mobile phone operators are committed to reaching 98% of households with indoor coverage uh, by the end of next year, and we're going to hold their feet to the fire to ensure that they deliver on those license obligations. Um, so that's about overall coverage. That's getting the basics in place. That's making sure we've got a, a country that's well connected. And to be frank, we've done pretty well. We're quite near the top of the leaderboard on that. Um, and we have 91% of premises have access uh, to superfast broadband as of today. So that's pretty good, but those 9% still need uh, the connection. But that is not enough. We also need to look forward. And there's going to be a point in this country when we need to have uh, uh, the very best connectivity because data usage is rising rapidly uh, and um, the Nielsen's law says that it, this will continue. This is the, uh, the law that data, data usage uh, increases exponentially and it's, it's, hap it, 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 it's, it's remained the case over the past um, few decades and I expect it to continue in the future. So in, it, when we catch up to par by getting everybody to super fast speeds um, and to, uh, to high speed, we don't want them to fall behind again. So that means, yes, driving forward fibre, but it also means that making sure that we are at the cutting edge of 5G technology as that comes in. There's loads of different things that we need to do in order to make all of that happen, uh, and I'm very happy to uh, uh, talk about any of them, uh, but our determination is very, very clear. Thank you. And in terms of open reach, when you said shortly after your, your much deserved appointment, the full se structural separation remains an option. Yes. What are the are there any trigger points that you see? In well, the, the, so we've said that all options remain on the table. Um, this is it's a complicated market because while BT have the vast majority of copper that's in the ground. Um, there is competition, actually, as David was saying, um, when it comes to uh, fibre or cable in the case of Virgin, you've got a uh, very serious cable network in. Um, so, uh, and then, of course, there's competition in, over uh, wireless. So there is a, uh, um, and you know, the market is for connectivity uh, at certain speeds. So um, Ofcom are currently looking at um, the separation, as you know. Sharon White had an article this morning in the Telegraph uh, describing where they are up to, um, and, um, and Ofcom, as the competition regulator, are the right place for this to uh, for this is the right place for this to be um, at the moment. But we, um, as I say, we have a bill before Parliament, and um, and all options are on the table. Thank you. We'll revert to the questions from the floor. Uh, the gentleman, the glass is just there. <coughs> Thanks. Yes, uh, Councillor Mike Dendall from City Board in Sheppey. Um, I notice most of your talk so far has been centred around business. I would uh, urge you to remember SMEs. We, we had a talk earlier on that 95% of the country is made of SMEs. Uh, a lot of them sitting at home. So I welcome all your efforts to get more and more broadband to individual private premises. I notice, however, you've not mentioned digital inclusion. High-speed broadband is as important to the government and to the public sector as it is to the businesses. All the efficiencies that are being driven at the moment, particularly uh, HM Revenue at the moment, is towards digital inclusion. I work with housing associations, I work with council, of course, and various other bodies, where the drive to make people connected and get their business done through digital means is driving efficiency, and we mentioned it earlier, productivity of the various councils in a very, very large way. So I'd like to emphasise the importance of public sector as well as business in getting the speed up on broadband. I myself am 
move on to the question. I myself, well, the question really is, um, we were talking about separation. I'm, I'm somewhat um, sympathetic to BT and so on. It's going to cost a lot of money. And I would like to ask what you believe separation would bring to the better funding for that speed. Well, uh, well so, so, I mean, I think if David and Ethan want to jump in, I mean, we just need to create a model by which we can we can roll out. And at the moment, um, we have an issue. I think where remember we are there's 500 customers of open reach, uh, and we just need to make sure they're all served equally. And frankly, there's, there's an environment where uh, you know, other options can be can be pursued. So firstly, I, I would suggest that we need to we need an ambition to build a gigabit society, a gigabit Britain. We need that ambition. I mean, it's a 10-year ambition, but we need that ambition. Um, you know, there's there's lots of terms of network to so they need to be included. Open reach needs to serve its whole customer base so it can be trusted. So, for example, we can think about co investment models. Uh, you can think about investing in, in other parts of Europe. Frankly, we, as I said, we, we, um, you know, what we have done is we've rolled out one part, another country rolled out another, and we shared that bit of network. So, the truth is, we need to find a number of different models, in my view, and then you know, 5G can pick up the end. But we never think we need fibre for 5G, we need even more fibre. So, but we need to find different ways, and, and, and I think to some extent, I, I agree. You know, we're not bad for a copper-based infrastructure, but that's not going to be good enough in the future. Right? I'm living in London, <laughs> and you know, well, and we're connecting more and more of my devices at home, including my, you know, five-year-old son, and it goes up and down. Right? I mean, it goes, even for me, it goes up and down. And you know, I'm trying to, you know, I'm on the Vodafone broadband, and it's, it's up and reach, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a maximum you can get. I've never had 76, but you know, I get 50. So, so it's just not going to be good enough for the future, and we do not have this debate with other infrastructure, right? We know that we need, you know, we know that basically the airports are full, the trains are full, the roads are full. You know, the broadband though is going to be full, right? We just need to do something about it. Actually, there were some seats available. Right. <laughs> 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 so you have to tweet it that way. <laughs> um, the gentleman there, the neighbour. Hello, uh, Dominic Morris, uh, Quiller Consultants and mid Beds District Conservative Association. One of the 9% are really looking forward to the universal service obligation coming in. Thanks, Matt. Um, two questions, one slightly geeky, but one a practical one. Paul, the three markets that you mentioned in Europe who have got good fire to the premise, Spain, Portugal and Sweden, have one thing in common. They've all got decent duct networks, mm -hmm. real ones. In the UK, the study I think you did with OpenReach says we've got probably 20% of viable duct network, the rest is snaky hose pipes that OpenReach don't even know where they are and when they find them they're full. Uh, how much more challenging, even if we've got the industry structures right and the incentives right, will that make faster out of flight to the premises? That's a geeky question. Second one is OpenReach's service standards are, to put it tactfully, but listening, sporadic, shall we say sporadic? Um, what incentive do you think restructuring would make to make those standards good, not sporadic? So, 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 so at the moment the discussion is really about how <coughs> open reach is to be managed, basically. Should it be more independent? We think yes. Uh, to make its own decisions, including you know, investment decisions. Should it keep more of its own money? We think yes. Because um, we all pay a lot of money to it, so we think that money should go, go back in the network more than it is today. Poles and ducts is another one. So that basically is how do we use the network that's there to, to and how do we how we possibly could run our own fibre through that network, right? Because obviously it's expensive to build more network. And that, that's the next cab off the rank for Ofcom to look at. Um, because we've had a regime in place for a number of years, it just hasn't worked. I think there's been one user of it where it has worked, as Dominic says, in other countries. And one of the reasons it's worked in other countries is they use this weird thing called the internet in Portugal, where you, you go on the internet and it shows you where the ducks are, it shows you what you can put in, it shows you what's already there. And you know, we need that in the UK, for example. We need to have that information, we need that transparency, we do not have that today. We have commitments to have that over a number of years and not been delivered. And then frankly, we just don't know what, what, where we are today. What we do know is the UK is expensive to use. You know, it's uh, an hole cover access, it's not quite the life to life, it's about 32 quid in Spain from memory. Or Portugal, I don't know they're up in this. either Spain or Portugal, I think it's Spain. Um, and it's around 600 quid, it's not exactly the same, but it is much more expensive today to use, to access today, so we need to look at that. So we need to look at cost, we need to know where it is, uh, and, and then we need to understand the quality of it. So the reality is there's a lot of work to do on that, and we've looked at it so far, you know, in sort of just practical terms, and we know there's a lot of problems. 
It doesn't mean we should stop that, which is, which is basically trying to utilise all the process. Um, Dominic, to service, I'm going to out you, Dominic. Uh, D Dominic, Dominic knows his stuff because he was a former very senior advisor to, uh, to Ofcom. Uh, and you will remember during that time, Dominic, the, uh, the, the levels of capital investment in the infrastructure were broadly flat during the time that you were at Ofcom. And that's essentially the legacy that we're suffering here. Actually, as BT has pushed its fibre upgrades into the network, its spending on copper has declined and the reliability of the infrastructure has plummeted. And that's why we've ended up in a situation where, frankly, it keeps on breaking down and then takes forever to damn well fix. And I think all of this comes down to willingness to invest, which goes back to my earlier point. At the moment, we have not got an optimised market structure to continue to invest in the infrastructure. And until we do that, frankly, those problems aren't going to go away, however much regulation you layer in to try to solve them. Thank you. Um, I should take some questions from the very back. Um, the mm. Jack with the glasses. Oh, right, sorry. <clears throat> Councillor Johnny Buckmore Camden in London, the, uh, haranguing you <laughs> another harangue. I'm clinically obsessed with Skype because I believe it, it yeah. will cut down a lot of you know meetings and need to come go around the country. My best Skype failure was from my home in Primrose Hill, which is half an hour's walk from Trafalgar Square, two miles away to Hampstead, where the test run was brilliant, and just as the meeting started, the signal wiped out. This is a national disgrace, this broadband situation. I know that there's debates about whether we should break up BT, but as the comment that's been rightly made is, the faster we put in broadband, the faster people use broadband. Surely this needs massive government intervention in order to keep England on a par with other countries. And the figure I heard, I may have got it wrong, was that we need £20 billion worth of investment. That's almost to a couple of quid what we're planning to spend on HS2. Scrap HS2. The, the country needs high speed broadband, not high speed rail. Can I, can I extent of government intervention? <laughs> Where to start? Um, the, um, uh, we have, of course, had a uh, subsidised uh, programme where the market. Um, wouldn't provide. But what we really need in, for fibre uh, is to make sure that we have a market that is competitive uh, and uh, cost effective for lots of different companies to come and invest. And, and that, is the, that is the goal here. Um, the, it, is a, it is an easy and, uh, dare I say, um, uh, overly simplified um, knee-jerk to say, therefore, the government needs to spend taxpayers' money. Um, there are countries around or, uh, to do the whole job. I have uh, no doubt that there's taxpayers' money needed, as we're using at the moment, um, to, um, uh, to plug gaps. Uh, but there's clearly a potential, a potential competitive market if we get the market structure right. Uh, and that's important. And let me just give you a couple of examples. There are countries around the world that have built uh, public sector fibre networks. Their take-up has often been quite low. But then there are other, there are, let me bring you back closer to home. Come with me to Hull. And Hull is famous for being the only part of the UK that is carved out of BT's USO for uh, voice. And I grew up with um, my an aunt and uncle who lived in Hull, and every time we went to visit them uh, from Chester, where I lived, um, we knew we were getting there when the phone boxes stopped being red and started being yellow. Um, and that's because Kingston's Telecom, or KCOM as it now is, um, ran the, the, the landlines around Hull. Last week, KCOM announced that they had reached 50% penetration for access to fibre. So it shows that with different strategic decisions, um, we can reach this within different market structures, and they are a vertically integrated local provider. So I think that the knee-jerk to say uh, we must charge people more in taxes or uh, reduce capacity on our railways in order to deliver more broad broadband, um, it, it, would, it, it, it would be better replaced with a view 
uh, and ultimately a, a conservative view, which is how do you structure the market to provide for what is clearly a distinct need, because I'd rather be talking to you about the interesting things going on uh, in Hampstead than about um, your the inability to Skype um, down the road to Primrose Hill. Um, thank you. And just to clarify, if, uh, Paul and David, if the market structure is right, you have no doubt that the private investment would be available to do everything. Uh, absolutely. The great no, no doubt whatsoever. Mm -hmm. the, the ability for us to essentially enter into long-term contracts by which you could, you could borrow private capital to make this investment is clearly there if we have the right market structure. And in other countries, that's precisely what they've been doing. But there is no, no way that we're going to need to spend 20 billion of public money on this. This is about mobilizing private capital almost above everything else. Thank you. Um, I'll hold you to that. The gentleman here and the gentleman very back. Uh, Chris Belk, uh, Chairman of the Conservative Transport Group. We've added, since I was Chairman of Broadband, as a mode of transport, uh, because it is, but I'm I introducing a Brexit point. Um, I understand in September, the EU Commission published a new electronic communication code. Uh, it was to um, commit all the members of the EU to universal one gig uh, broadband and 5G uh, wireless by 2025 commitment, and their today target is 100 megabit as opposed to tower 10 megabit going to the House of Commons at the moment. I second the HS2 comment. Thank you. Um, but as you just go, can I just respond to one detail on that? Um, we're putting through a USO in which we are not putting the speed onto the face of the bill. We're purposefully leaving that in secondary regulation with a requirement on Ofcom uh, to assess what is the appropriate speed okay. over time. So, so, so the situation actually, um, the 10 megabits is the Ofcom's current assessment of current need, and that is, so the bill is actually much more uh, uh, forward thinking. That was David Cameron's statement that come in this, going back. Um, Hello, yeah, um, Councillor Wilgrover, uh, message for a question for David. Um, where I represent in, in Lincolnshire and East Lindsay, um, I think I represent the 9%. I mean, we're not talking about a lack of internet, we're talking about a lack of capable telephone lines. I've got a, a village where they actually struggle to call each other in the village because the line is that bad. So, absolutely, I hear you, we're the 9%. But the question is, uh, one of the panel members mentioned earlier on that the Virgin is getting on and they're, they're developing a pretty good fibre network. If you're fed up with waiting for open reach, why can't you and Vodafone, if you're saying you've got this money to invest, why can't you just get on with it, team up with Virgin, or just come up with your own way to develop your own network? Well, I, as I explained earlier, we did actually look at, uh, at doing that and we did work with Talk Talk uh, in York to, to experiment with what it would look like to build our own network. Uh, and, and we discovered, quite frankly, that without the, uh, you know, the, the ability to, to aggregate all of that demand, that the, the fact, frankly, the economics are very difficult. I think, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying about, about Virgin, but at the moment their network isn't available to us. Um, and in fact, they're, they're not really building a, a fibre network so much as adding a bit of fibre onto the edges of their existing copper coaxial uh, cable network. So it's a slightly, a slightly different uh, model. But look, <laughs> No, none of us can, can avoid but to sympathise with the situation that you're in. It's deeply frustrating when you can't get to connectivity and you're probably sitting there listening to us all pontificating about getting fibre to the premise and you're thinking, do you know what, I, I just like a copper line that worked. I, I, I totally get it. And it's clear that at the, at, the, at the uneconomic areas there is a need for government intervention and, and you know, Matt and his government have been very proactive in doing that. The problem is that you simply don't know how much investment by the government is going to be needed in those circumstances until you've worked out what the private sector will deliver. And I think our message is, at the moment, we don't have a plan for the private sector to deliver this investment. And that's what we need. And then we can all work together to make sure that those areas that aren't going to be covered by this new technology are, are, are addressed. Thank you. Um, yeah, the gentleman right at that, please, and then the gentleman here. 
Thank you. I'd like to respond to the uh, quickly HS2 comment as, as a Birmingham SME. My house isn't a 30 minute walk from uh, Trafalgar Square, but I do look forward to being 48 minutes away from there when HS2 arrives. <laughs> Uh, Rob Speed uh, lives from Peace, although in my day job I work for the BBC. I'm responsible for iPlayer, for part of iPlayer, uh, Boosting 3 uh, and Red Button. Um, it's really, can we at one stroke, very simply, just legislate that all new properties, we, we're going to build, what, 250,000 houses a year, you know where I'm going now, have to have fibre. That's coming in from January. All right. <laughs> that was quick. Can we have more questions like the last two? This is going well. Oh, this is a less yes-no one then. I, I, I'm Chris Paper. I'm on the Federation of Communication Services, which is uh, for SMEs delivering professional services to SMEs. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you how frustrating it is when you've got a single monopoly upstream provider who lets you down on 30% of your installs. You can guess for yourselves how that is. Um, I want to talk a little bit about these, these people like the, the gentleman here from Lincolnshire and the lady here who, who've got these problems. I just want to suggest there is a paucity of ambition. And the, the paucity of ambition is that if you live in a rural area, you kind of should be grateful for what you can get hold of. And it seems to me that this is a lot of the thinking in this universal service obligation. May I suggest there is an alternative? May I suggest that actually, rather than talking about how we're all going to build infrastructure out, we say, how are we, the community, going to build back to the infrastructure which is available? If there is high quality fibre infrastructure to the BT CAD, Let's have access to that infrastructure on a wholesale basis at that CAD and let's let the local community work out how it's going to get that back. And that could be by whatever means, whatever technology. But that community then can start with the expectation of gigabit Britain and if its expectation has to be marked down straight away because actually 20 meg is all that's reasonably viable, at least they will have had that conversation. At the moment, we're kind of telling them you're lucky to get anything better than dial up. That's not quite good enough, is it? Sorry, that's the question. So the, this is another, this question follows in the same vein as the previous two, because this is happening, and it's happening right around the country, and it's happening with uh, uh, companies like uh, City Fibre, uh, GigaClear, there's a whole series of alternative community-based and uh, highly commercial networks that are coming in to do this. The question is, how do we make that, make, make that much easier? So the ducks and poles access is important, but the market structure is important as well, because you know, in a way, the whole community having to come together to do that uh, is because um, the, um, the the market structure uh, needs to be looked at, and and so um, that that is happening. If you have that level of frustration, you can go and make out that happen, but it requires quite a lot of local coordination. Because ultimately, as with many utilities, um, there's a coordination issue that you know there have to be enough people in your village who are prepared to dig deep to share in the costs of the fibre network, so there's a first mover advantage um, problem, and that's why there's a role for government in structuring a market, and in some cases putting in taxpayers' cash in order to sort it out. Thank you. Um, I, the, the very last question. Okay. Um, uh, no one's all good satellites. Um, my direction is satellite terminals. Uh, that's something Sky could do for themselves, really. Plop that file roads down in the village, and uh, hook it up with fixed radio access. Um, well, uh, <coughs> unfortunately, I'm not a techie, so I can't tell you. I can't tell you whether that was, is, is, is efficacious. But what I can tell you is that you know we we don't put the satellites in the air. What we do is we take some of the risk from the satellite owner to enable them to finance putting the satellites in the air. And actually, that is the right role for us. That's how we can make this infrastructure investment happen. And I think the absolutely analogous for investment in fixed infrastructure. We, we are able to bear some of the risk which will enable those investments to happen in the first place and if we get the right market structure our appetite to do that will help to make this happen more quickly. Okay. Okay. You, you can also flow in fibres down gas pipes so uh, you needn't be stuck with uh, BT ducts. You, you, you may be right on that. I, the, one, the one thing I do know is my, my brother is a uh, head of wastewater at a water company and um, 
he tells me that what, the thing they hate the most is putting <coughs> cables into their wastewater pipes because of a thing called ragging. It's really not very nice, apparently. <laughs> Thank you. Can you join me in thanking our, uh, uh, the panel? Uh, does seem to be revisited time and time again. Uh, I very much hope that with Max in charge, um, we'll be talking about solutions as opposed to problems in the future. Thank you.